Blog Talk Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, good evening. It is the voice of the people. It is actually October 9th, a day that I call Indigenous Peoples Day because uh, that guy that they call Christopher Columbus, I'm not sure if he found anything except people that were already here. But I'm in the studio. I was here, my man Mark Lee. Mark, what's going on with you? Not much, you know, just having a relaxing evening here in Durham, North Carolina right now, but uh, definitely can agree with you what you, what you said about Columbus Day. But I can tell the man was lost. He, he wasn't even sure where he was going. He was a little bit on the lost side and was trying to find some place and stumble across the place that was already uh, had people in it and might have even, you know, there's even talk about the fact that he wasn't even the first uh European that was here, because I believe Belief Erickson and some other folks might have been here even earlier than him, those Viking folks, so uh, he he was lost, and and he was even late lost. (laughs) Lost, late to the party, and tried to claim everything. Now, what kind of game is that right there? Not sure, but hey. (laughs) But we got people playing simpler kind of games, because I don't know if you called this, but you know, Pence decided to walk out of a San Francisco 49er game because of the protests that are going on around the NFL. Last time I checked, didn't a lot of this stuff start in San Francisco? So it sounds to me like he was already knowing what he was walking into, and it was a really bad PR stunt for him to walk in there. Say King would be all indignant that this protest was going on when the whole San Francisco organization and said that they had backed what was going on. So you walk into something that you know what you're going to get into, and then you claim you're indignant. You know what? I, he had to make it dramatic because right there in, in in Salt Lake City, another police shooting happened, which they claimed was justified, and the gentleman lost his life, unfortunately. So while he's in his feelings, walking out, because he they already told you what they were going to do, and you went there anyway. I guess you were hoping for, you know, a different result, like, oh, when I show up, they're going to, change the way that they do things, but yeah, I understand no one cares, dude. Like, y'all have not done anything worthwhile. Meanwhile, Patrick Harmon is, is now deceased, and he ran from the Salt Lake City, Utah police. I guess he had an outstanding warrant. They let him know he was on his bike, and they said he didn't have his uh, rear light. So then after they ran a check, found out he had warrants, were going to arrest him. He took off running. Officer fired three shots. He was pronounced dead later. Nowhere that I know can a man be a fleeing suspect and you shoot him in the back. You know, they did it in South Carolina, but I guess they figured that's the norm now. You know, if you run, shoot him. But... You know, I I look at the protest thing, you know, it's been twisted all around. Now it's about, oh, they're being disrespectful to the military and all this, and it never was that. Um, So while they're playing that little game right there, trying to control the narrative and spin it around, it takes away from the fact that another individual has lost his life. Whether he was guilty or whether he was innocent, all that man was doing was riding a bike that I see. No, he had some exactly. warrants, and he had to he had to answer for that. I understand, and in his fear, he ran. So, I don't the the bullets are not justified. There's no way you can convince me, even if he turned around and was still running away, saying, "I'm gonna stab you," which they claim he said. He never turned around to run toward them, so the threat was leaving you. In no world that I know, and no training that I had, were you to shoot a fleeing suspect. Like so, you know, it, it's just <laughs> it's just a crazy see. world we live in. Because we also got right wing folks that are sitting there and trying to come up with a new strategy for how they're going to um, speak to the folks that they want to speak to, their base and things of that nature. So now they're going to different universities and getting the universities to agree to speak under the whole freedom of speech thing, because apparently that's what they did recently in, uh, I believe they've done it in Virginia. They've got plans already to do it this month at the University of Florida, which 
they grudgingly gave consent on the freedom of um, speech grounds. And lawyer Cal Bristow has said that they're coming after Ohio State and the University of Cincinnati, saying that they have until Friday to approve um, Richard Spencer's request to appear there or face litigation. So apparently they're going to these different universities and trying to play the uh, freedom of speech card. Wait, did you just say face litigation? So basically, if you don't approve us to come, we're going to sue you? That's basically what they're saying. So, all right, that doesn't make sense because you can't just walk into somebody. I can't go to my neighbor's house and just walk in there like, look, I got some stuff I want to say, and if you don't allow me to in your front door, I'm going to sue you under the freedom of speech. It's gotten so out of hand that it, it I don't know. I This weekend I had the honor of meeting and also sitting at the same table with Bobby Seale. And if y'all don't know who he is, turn the card in. You know what I mean? But to to sit there and just listen to him talk at first, because, you know, you somebody like that, you don't do too much talking. You just listen. You, you know, listen and, learn. and for him to, before he did his keynote speech and was talking to some other people at the table, and he was talking about how it seems like everybody now doesn't investigate things before um, investigate things, formulate a plan of action before putting something into action. We just are very reactive and we just jump into stuff and, and along the way we try to figure out what we're going to do and it doesn't make sense. And I was like, I can't argue that point. You know, I can't argue anything because you've been there. Y'all have done it. Y'all have done it successfully to the point where the government shut you down because they said it is no logical way that all this could have been started on a college campus and just took off and implemented programs that, oh, snap, we need to use these programs nationwide. But they started it first. We got to eliminate them so we can take this stuff. All kinds of craziness, you know, but to just listen to well, you know, and We also had the pleasure of having a speaker from your neck of the woods, New Jersey, that came down and was the keynote speaker here in North Carolina, I had the North Carolina NAACP. I did not have the pleasure of making that. I had some other commitments, but I did read what he said, and he was basically uh, saying that um, we need to stay in the struggle and continue the fight for justice, and that was uh, Cory Booker from New Jersey. Okay. He came and was the keynote speaker in the North Carolina NAACP, and, um, of course, uh, Reverend Barber was also speaking, as he is now getting ready to uh, step off from the state stage and go into even more of a national stage, and he kind of tries to – Rekindle the poor people's uh, march that MLK started many years ago. So uh, mm-hmm. that was really uh, interesting hearing some of his remarks and basically saying that, you know, let's not uh, give up on the fight but to continue the fight. So that was definitely good to hear. And I understand that we have a guest in the house today who has definitely mm-hmm. been in the forefront of our leadership here in North Carolina. So I want to hear oh, yeah, what Right on time. Uh, it should be right Ms. Jillian Johnson. So good evening, ma'am. Welcome to the Voice of the People. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. How are you doing, Jilly? I was just telling. I'm doing uh, all right. Well, that's good to hear. I was just telling uh, Brother Dean that uh, I've known you to be somewhat in the forefront ever since you came down here to Durham in the Duke on the Duke campus, and uh, I think I probably <laughs> first met you during the Occupy Durham kind of days when we were trying to find ways to get all kinds of justice and things that are still on the forefront of people's minds. Because I remember, I remember Occupy Durham talking about things dealing with gentrification, dealing with uh, health issues and the health disparities that goes on and things of that nature. And you were definitely at the forefront of that as well as uh, at the forefront of a lot of other things as well. So, And now you're on the city council. And, of course, we're on the eve of a uh, city council primary. So just wanted to hear a little bit and tell folks a little bit about you and if you'll just give them a little bit of your history and how you became an activist, and then we'll go from there. <laughs> sure. Um, well, yeah, I think I did um, meet you for the first time, Mark, during Occupy Durham. I think that was a really exciting moment for um, you know, for, for the national progressive movement and for the left in general, for this occupation up in New York to get so much attention and have – um, you know, spawn all these little occupations all over the country, and Occupy Durham was just one of of hundreds um, of projects that 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 
uh, you know, happened during during that time. But um, yeah, when people when people ask me how I got started in activism, I like to tell the story of my um, my first ever labor campaign, which happened in uh, 1986. Um, sorry, 87. When I was six years old. I uh, decided that the chores that my parents had assigned to me and my brother were um, were just too much, and I, I organized a strike, and uh, my four-year-old brother and I went on strike. We made picket signs and uh, picketed in our living room, chanting kids on strike, <laughs> and um, the signs that we made actually said kids on strike because I didn't know about silent E's uh, at the age of six. And of course, our strike was was brutally crushed by the authoritarian regime um, in our household. And I'm thankful for that now, of course, because I, you know, now force my own children to to do their chores and and find that highly appropriate. But um, that's the that's the first time I remember um, doing doing any sort of activism. And I still have no idea where I got that idea, and neither my mother nor my father can tell me where I ever got the idea uh, of going on strike. I used to watch a lot of Sesame Street, so we think maybe there was a Sesame Street episode in the early 80s that that featured a strike, but somehow I got the idea that if something was unfair, that the, the proper, uh, the proper uh, response to that was to go on strike, and so that's what I did. Um, so, yeah, so that was 30 years ago now, and I'm still at it. Now, exactly what was your parents' reaction when you went on strike? Cause I'm, just, I'm trying to, like, picture this. Um, so, and, and were your parents activists themselves? <laughs> yeah. Well, they were not impressed. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that uh, my, chore, my chores were um, were non-negotiable. Uh, my parents were not activists, but they were both very active in their community. My dad was a uh, worked for a bank in the community development department and did a lot of work on um, community uh, community lending and um, did small business lending for some community development banks. And my mom was a social worker. She worked for Child Protective Services when I was growing up. And so they were both very active in the community, were very, um, you know, bo- both had jobs and were very committed to, to improving the world and, and making the world a better place. And that definitely um, that definitely soaked in to, to my childhood and to my goals for, for what I wanted to do, um, for what I wanted to do in my career. So, where did you grow up again? Because you did not grow up in North Carolina. Or Atlanta, I did maybe. not. Yeah, I grew up in I grew up in Virginia. Uh, I was born in Charlottesville and moved to Northern Virginia as a young a young child and stayed there until about middle school. And then I um, moved to Richmond, Virginia, and spent a few years there. <laughs> spent one year in Chicago and then came here. Came to Durham in '99 um, when I was 18 to do an undergraduate degree at Duke. So I've been here um, now for 18 years. Wow. Now, now you have two kids of your own. Now, have any of these kids of yours launched a strike called you? Or have you like, they have them, not. Go. And, you know, <laughs> and that is surprising because both of them have been going to demonstrations since before they could walk or talk. Um, my, I have a 10-year-old son, and the first demonstration that he ever went to was HK on J in 2007. Um, he was about three months old. That was his first his first march. Um, and my my three year old uh, son, the first march he ever went to, I believe it was a little bit later. I think he was six months old, and his first march was Moral Monday, Moral Monday March in Raleigh. Um, so they've both been out in the streets with me from the beginning. Um, I would not be surprised if one day those kids decide to decide to join forces and and resist my tyranny in, in some way. <laughs> now, you were involved in the uh, more money than the weather is occupied. Now, this, you know, we can now look at them in hindsight, more money than what still goes on to some degree, but um, definitely uh, now that Pat McCoy is out of office, there's not as much in the news, Occupy has right. ended and everything. How do you think, how successful do you think those movements were, or do you think that there are things that could have been done better or could have been done differently? Yeah, I mean, I I think they were both incredibly impactful, both for, you know, for for the results that were gained and for moving the conversation. I think Occupy was a critical piece of changing the conversation around this idea of of trickle-down economics 
and folks starting to realize that trickle-down economics is a lie, that it does not work. Um, 